in chapter three. So we'll start with chapter two, which is customer service. So the first thing we'll start off with talking about is to make sure that you understand that there's lots of different types of customers, both internal and external. When people think about customers, they automatically usually think about the customers, patients, which is our what customers? Internal or external? Patients. Patients are external customers, but people don't always think about our internal customers which is what we have listed here. So those are your physicians, your nurses, any other healthcare professionals you may have in there, your, your therapists, as well as your employees and your other supervisors and managers. Internal customers are just as important as external customers because if these customers aren't happy, they can't provide satisfaction to your external customers. Um, sometimes I think that in management, when we're managing other people, we sometimes forget this, that we need to make sure everybody's happy, all of our customers, not just the patients, but also the people that we work with. Physicians as internal customers are very important because they often have a lot of demands, they often have a lot of needs, um, and so we definitely, as managers, want to try to please them as much as possible. So some of the things that they usually want, they want things fast because they don't have a lot of time. They're always you know, running around doing things, working with patients. So the more you can save them time, the more you can do things fast for them, the happier they're gonna be. And they usually like to be kept up to date with the latest technology. So what do our external customers want? What do our patients want? Here are some of the examples of things that patients want. They often talk about food. They want the food to taste good. They want to have a clean room. They don't want a room that smells bad or that's dirty or it's cleaned every other day. And they want staff that's going to treat them nice. So happy, cheerful staff, not staff that's just walking in like, this is my job. I'm just going to come in here and do it and leave. They want staff that are acting like they really want to be there. Here are three things that are essential to customer service, so we have our systems, our strategies, and our employees. So we'll start with systems. When you think of systems, not looking at what's up here, what do you think about what comes to mind when you hear systems? How do you get items done, like who's in charge of what department? All right, so how to get things done, who's in charge? All right, anybody else? So he's kind of on the right track. Systems has to do with how things get done. Um, so how do things get done? We have to have good policies. We have to have good customer service. We have to have um, groups and committees to make sure things get done. Um, and so those are the types of things that keep everything and everyone on track. So our systems have to be in place. What about strategies? Anything come to mind? Plans. Plans. Plans, Plans good. Anybody else? had two plans. Um, so the one thing that always comes to my mind when I hear strategy in addition to planning is mission. Because the mission, drive, the mission of the organization drives everything. And so regardless of what type of plan you have, it has to match what the organization's mission is. Mission's not up here, but that's what comes to mind when I think about strategies. Other things um, that are related to strategies is the organizational culture, which again kind of aligns with the mission. Um, and with the culture, we mean how does the organization do things? Um, what do you think of when you think of that organization? Do you think of a warm and friendly organization or do you think of a, a tough and non-personal organization? That's, that would be their culture. Um, and feedback mechanisms. It's always important to make sure you have feedback me mechanisms in place to know how you're doing. So. There's some organizations that don't pay much attention to the customer satisfaction surveys, when in fact you should because that's a direct indicator of how other people are perceiving you, how your customers are perceiving you. 
So it's very important to make sure you have good feedback mechanisms in place so that you can continue to improve over time. And last one, employees. What comes to mind? Customer service, employees. If they're happy or not, so satisfaction. Anything else? So hiring people? No, like bringing more. Um, Referring? Yeah, referrals. Okay, referrals. If they fit the team chemistry. All right, if they fit the team chemistry. All good answers. Um, so we'll quickly go through these. You want to respond to the needs of your employees. <coughs> you want to find the best possible team of employees. You want to empower employees to solve problems. Teach by example and insist on excellent customer service. Um, again, it kind of goes back to the organizational culture. If within that culture, customer service is really important, then this last one is key. The only way that that's going to be important in that culture is if the managers continue to hamper down on that and insist that the employees provide nothing less than excellent customer service. We're going to talk a little bit about how do you find employees that can fit into that culture of having great customer service? Has anybody ever heard of this before? Um, hire for attitude, train for skill. So when you get into a management position, um, you'll probably be pulled into some of the hiring processes and you'll be able to interview candidates. And you may think that the person that looks good on paper and that comes in to the interview is very well spoken is the one you want to hire um, because they've presented to you that they are a good candidate and they have the skills. That may not always be the case. You may need to hire for attitude um, and just be confident that you can train them later. It's a lot easier to train someone for a skill than to train someone not to be in a bad attitude all the time because those types of traits and characteristics are a lot deeper within as opposed to just not knowing how to use Excel. So when you're in that, that management position and you're, you're interviewing people, you wanna keep this in mind, especially if you're in an organization that focuses on customer service. You wanna make sure that you're hiring people that have positive, friendly attitudes that are gonna provide that high level of customer service that you need. And then, you know, the other skills that they may not, uh, you know, be too adapt in or may need to come up in, you just train them, send them the extra training, you have orientations for them, and, and they'll, they'll get up to speed. So continuing on about employee in orientation, here are a few things that should happen during that time. And orientation is very important because it's the first exposure that your new employee has to the organization. So if your orientation process is not good at all, it may not have a good um, impact on the employee. They may not be happy, they may say, oh, I made a bad decision, I shouldn't have came to work here. So you wanna make sure that the orientation is <clears throat> not only warm and fuzzy, but also very informational so that they get all the tools and all the information they need to do their job correctly. So again, if we're still talking about customer service and we're uh, doing our employee orientation, one of the things we want to do is make sure that our employees also know who our customers are. We want to make sure they understand that we have patients as our external customers and healthcare providers and employees and staff as our internal customers. Another thing you would want to do during orientation is teach them about customer service. You may want to show them different videos about different companies that have really good customer service. Um, can any of you guys give an example of a company that you think has really good customer service? Chick-fil-A. Chick-fil-A, all right. Anybody else? Food Lion. Food Lion, all right. Everybody else has poor customer service experiences? <laughs> H&R Block. H and R Block. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think makes the companies that came to your mind? What is it that they do that help you to come to that decision to pick that company? They work together. As a company. They work together. Yeah. Okay. That's why. What With the training um, 
they tell you what they expect and then you do role playing and the number one goal is to satisfy the customer and be pleasant over the phone. I mean, smiling, you know, mm -hmm. okay. to portray that. So it sounds like one of your examples was through personal experience and your example was through personal observation. <coughs> mm -hmm. Okay. So when you're training the employees, you may want to give them examples like that of places that you define as having good customer service so they can have clear examples of how they should provide customer service in your organization. Um, and then the last thing you want to do in the orientation is train them how to care about quality. Quality is becoming more and more important in healthcare. And we know that quality is directly linked to customer service and, and patient satisfaction because if patients receive high quality, usually they're satisfied. Patients receive poor quality and they're not turned every two hours, they're not going to be satisfied. Um, now when you do your evaluations on your employees, this is a great opportunity to talk to them about customer service, whether it's been you've provided good customer service or you need to work on your customer service. But the evaluation time is a great opportunity to evaluate that. And if they have been doing really good exceptional customer service, if you can, make sure you can reward them, whether it be you know a certificate on the wall or a movie gift card or, or just recognition in the staff meeting. But those that go above and beyond should be rewarded some type of way for their customer service. Um, any questions about customer service, chapter two? All right, chapter three, it's a little bit long, so we're gonna jump right into it, it's basic management functions. And some of this we covered in uh, 110, but it's kinda gonna be like a review and we're gonna expound a little bit more on it. So the first function is planning. We all know what planning is, right? It's one of the most important management functions as a manager. Um, and some of it requires you to create goals and objectives, timelines, uh, projections and forecasts, all of that is involved in planning. And planning obviously is always involved in looking into the future. The more you plan, the more organized you're gonna be as a manager in most cases, um, because as it says, you wanna make sure you're proactive as much as possible. You don't always wanna be that manager that's reactive and putting out fires because you didn't plan something last week like you should have. Here are a few different types of plans. I'll quickly go through them. You have your strategic plans, which deal with long range goals, your tactical plans, which um, break down specific um, objectives. Functional plans, that relates to your major departments and how they function. Operational plans, address how things work. We just talked about systems that will fall under your operational plans. And financial plans, obviously, address money, how the money's coming in, how it's going out, how we're saving money, how we're making money, et cetera, et cetera. Here are a few other types of plans or planning. You have career planning, everybody knows what that is, how we're focusing on um, professional development and you know perhaps more education to go along with our career. You have time management, which we talked about on Tuesday is very important, and daily work planning. As a manager, I think an effective manager every day is gonna come in with a plan. Probably the first 15 minutes of their day should consist of sitting down at their desk and writing out their daily plan, whether that be Okay, first hour I'm gonna round, go around to everybody to see what everybody's doing today. Second hour I'm gonna do these reports. Third hour I have to meet with my boss. Whatever the, the daily plan is, I recommend that it be the first thing you do when you walk in the door. Otherwise, if you don't lay out your daily plan, you're gonna waste so much time because people are gonna start coming into your office and you're gonna forget some of the things that you have to do and that's how you fall behind and then that's how you become a reactive manager and you have to put out those fires that we just talked about. So what are some key elements of planning? I just <coughs> talked about mission a little while ago, but we also have vision, goals, objectives, strategy, and action. All these are key 
um, to consider when you're doing your planning. If you don't consider these, then your plan is probably not going to be very effective. So what's our vision? This is a statement where we talk about how we see ourselves. Where do we see ourselves in five years, 10 years? Um, so the vision is what you see as an organization. Where do you see the organization? The mission, we already know, explains what the purpose of our organization is and basically tells why we exist. Why are we here? Our goals and objectives. Our goals and objectives both need to be very specific. You don't want them to be uh, too ambiguous or too much gray area. You want it to be clear black and white because that's going to make it easier to achieve. So for example, an object objective should include these things. What are we doing? What is it to be done? How much is it to be done? And when must it be done by? These are key things that you guys may want to consider when you're working on your project and you're putting together your team objectives as to how you're going to figure out what the solution is to the problem that you're going to get. I'll say this again. These are key things that you probably want to consider with your group project. Um, these are questions you probably want to ask to help you get to your solution. How do we make sure we have an effective strategy? Well, obviously we just talked about our vision, vision, mission, goals, and objectives. We want to make sure that our top management, so that's our president, our CEO, um, our administrator, whoever's at the top, they have to be on board, they have to be committed, and they have to be visible. They can't just support what you're doing from behind a closed door in their office because no one will see that. So it's important that they not only support you, but that it's visible support and everybody is aware that they're on board with you. You want to make sure you have effective systems in place, quality tools and techniques. You could have all the greatest plans in the world, but if you don't have the resources and tools to achieve those goals, then it's going to be very difficult to do. So having quality tools and techniques may mean um, extra training, may mean having to spend more money for new equipment or spend money to hire an additional person because you're lacking staff resources, whatever it may be. You have to have quality tools, techniques, and resources in place to be able to have an effective strategy. You want to make sure you have sufficient time to carry out the plans and that's directly related to time management. Again, if you have this great plan, but you wait until the last minute to try to execute it, it's probably not going to be that successful. So again, you can translate this to your projects. If you guys come up with great ideas, but you wait until the last week to put it together, mm -hmm. you're probably not going to have that good of a presentation, right? Mm -hmm. So you want to make sure you have sufficient time to carry out your plans. And then you want to have good employees. You want to have employees that feel empowered, that feel competent to do their job, and that are obviously caring. So, action plan steps. Everybody know what an action plan is, right? Plan of action. Here are a few steps. First, we want to identify the problem or the need. Good, you guys are taking notes because a lot of this is help, going to be helpful for you on your project. You want to identify the problem or the need. So once you get the problem from the manager, next you want to obtain and analyze data. So you may want to ask some questions that are related to data. Um, how many patients did this happen to? For how long has this been happening? How many days per week does this happen? Any kind of numbers you can get may be helpful to you. So you want to obtain and analyze any data you can get. You want to determine the best action. So you can come up with five solutions. You want to make sure out of that five, you pick the best one. The best one may not be just the best one. The best one may be the most feasible one. That's the most budget friendly one. You can have a great plan, but if you know you can't afford it, is it really a great plan? So you want to consider all of those things when you choose the best action. And then once you have the action, you want to carry out the plan. So if we're still thinking in terms of your project, this part may not be so related to you because you obviously don't work there. 
but this is gonna be the job of the clinic to once they get your plans, to carry it out. Otherwise, that issue's not going away. And then, it's also gonna be their job to monitor the progress. So after you guys are done, and you have the best action plan, the best solution for them, and they carry out the plan, they can't stop there. They have to monitor that change that they've done to see if it's working or not. Because if it's not working, they may have to go back to the drawing board, or they may have to come back to me, and I have to get another class to give them another solution, right? All right, so these are action plan steps. Organizing. It's a process of preparing or gearing up to do something. So to implement decisions that happen as a result from your planning. And organizing also obviously brings structure. So it helps you to have structure to make sure that everything gets done. So once you have your action plan, you have your steps, you have to make sure that organization is there also. You can't just have steps here, 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 and here. You want to make sure the steps are organized and that everything's set in place. All right, values. Values are, and there can be um, personal values as well as corporate or business values. And they may not always be the same. Um, but in a value statement, the organization or the employer is basically going to tell or express what they feel is important or um, what they see, how they see loyalty or, or how they view their ethics. So you may want to ask, do they have a value statement? Does the clinic have a value statement? All those types of questions may help you get to um, what you're trying to solve. So we just discussed that um, there's personal values as well as corporate values, and they may not be the same, um, but personal values are pretty much the same. It's how you or what you consider ethical or unethical, and what you value and, and what you think is loyal. Or So what you personally think is ethical or unethical, your company may think is ethical. And so sometimes there may be a little bit of a conflict there um, and you have to decide how important that is. Do your personal values override the corporate values? If so, it may be time to look for a new place to work, right? Um, but the, the take home here is to just note that there's personal values and corporate values and that they may not always be the same. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about personnel administration. This involves hiring, orientation, and training of new employees. It also involves delegation, so assigning work to other people, scheduling, um, coaching and counseling your employees as well. Does anybody know what span of control is? Span of control is basically the span by which you manage people. So if I'm the manager and if I'm the manager of this classroom, my span of control is nine, mm -hmm. 10, count. nine, um, <laughs> nine, <laughs> because there's nine people in here. So basically um, it relates to the number of people you manage. So you'll have some managers in a hospital that have a very small span of control. They may only manage one or two people. And then some will manage 50 or 75. And the span of control directly relates to the manager's performance because sometimes you may be managing too many people and it's just too much work for you to handle for one manager to handle 75 people. Um, and so that's when assigning work becomes very important especially if you have a large span of control. And here are some of the things that you need to make sure that you know before you assign the work. Number one, you gotta know what must be done. You can't just say, um, go take out this trash. You gotta know where he's taking the trash out, you know, all the details behind taking out the trash. You gotta know exactly what's gonna be done. 
You want to know what does he need to take out of the trash? What equipment and supplies does he need? He probably needs garbage bags, probably needs gloves, probably needs garbage cans, whatever. So you have to know <coughs> all the equipment and supplies that are needed. You want, to know, you want to know what authority the employee has. So I need to know if he has an employee to say, you know what, I'm not taking out the trash. He may have that authority to say that, or you may just have to say, yes, ma'am. So I need to know what the authority is, and I need to know what the quality and productivity requirements that must be met. So I need to know that if I tell him to take out the trash, that there should not be any sharps in that garbage bag. Does everybody know what sharps are? Mm -hmm. Needles? Mm -hmm. So that deals with quality. So I need to know all of that that's related to his job of taking out the trash. And I need to know productivity, I may need to know that that trash should be taken out two to three times a day. So I need to know all of that. And you may say, taking out the trash sounds so simple, but when I break it down like that, you see that there's a lot that goes behind assigning someone something to do. All right, so we're continuing. What else do I need to know? What cost constraints are? So there may be costs associated with that trash because even though he takes out the trash, there has to be a city garbage truck to come pick up that trash. And maybe they charge us per visit, or maybe they charge us by the weight of the garbage. Whatever that may be, I have to know what that cost is that's related to taking out the trash. Again, I need to know where each task is to be performed. So if there's a specific garbage can that he's supposed to be dumping this trash in, um, behind the building, I need to know where that dumpster is to make sure he's taking it there and not somewhere else because that could be related to our costs <coughs> if he's dumping the trash somewhere that he's not supposed to. I don't know if you guys know, but if organizations get caught dumping sharps in the trash, they can get fined. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, knowing where can relate directly to the cost. I need to know where the supplies and service supports are found. So even if I know that he needs trash bags, I need to know where they are. And where to obtain help when needed. So that may mean I may need to know who his boss is, who his other coworkers are. That way, if he gets behind and taking out the trash, I can go solicit someone else to help. Um, when I assign him the task, I need to know who does what. So I may have told him to take out the trash on the third floor, and he may be responsible for the fourth floor. So I could be making a mistake. So that's why I need to know who does what. Maybe I've gone to the wrong person. Maybe I need to go to her who was responsible for the third floor instead of him. Um, when the work must be done, we kind of already talked about that. If he's supposed to take it out two, three times a day, 12 p.m., 5 p.m., I need to know that. Um, when changes must be made, maybe on holidays, we only take the trash out once. If that's the case, I need to be aware of that as a manager when I'm assigning him the work. So I can tell him, you know, it's Memorial Day, you don't have to take the trash out at 12 p.m. today and that's it. Um, how the work is to be performed. When I used to work in a hospital, I went around and I shadowed everybody in the different departments. So one day, I shadowed the custodians. I went around, I took out the trash, I cleaned the, helped clean the bathroom, sweep and mop, because I was trying to find out, I was not only trying to build a relationship with the custodial staff, but I was also trying to see how they actually do their work. And, all, and I felt the best way for me to figure that out was to actually shadow them for a day and work with them for a day. So, and, and that goes back to, once I, once I did that, I could actually see how their typical day is, what exactly it is they do. I may have found that taking the trash out is a hard job, but I would not have known that unless I went and shadowed them. And I did that to gain knowledge on how the work is to be performed. All right, last one. Um, you need to know how well, how quickly, and how economically the work must be done. Now we talked about um, taking out the trash and that there may be costs associated with 
um, the city coming to pick up the trash. So we may find out that we can have them come every other day as opposed to every day because that may save us some money. So those are the types of things that we would have to know as a, as a manager. And the last thing, why the work must be done and how that employee's work fits into the picture. So why does the trash have to be taken out? Anybody? Because it'll overflow if it doesn't. <coughs> there we are. Sanitary yeah, reasons. And yeah. where are we working? In a hospital. In a hospital. So it has to be clean, right? Mm -hmm. Taking out the trash is very, very important. So we must know why the work is done and how the employee's work fits into the big picture. Now I've been picking on this gentleman, <laughs> but he has a very important job. And someone tell me how his job of taking out the trash fits into the big picture. <coughs> Cleanliness. What else? It says sanitation. For sanitation. Keeping patients safe. There we are. Keeping patients safe and healthy. And healthy. We're trying yeah. to get them out of the hospital, right? And the only reason they're going to leave the hospital is if they are healthy. healthy. So while taking out the trash may seem like such a mundane, unimportant job, as the manager, you have to make sure that employee understands how his mundane job fits into the big picture and how what he does is actually very important. Because if he understands that, he probably will have a lot more confidence about his job, will be happy to come in every day and contribute to the cause of the big picture as opposed to just thinking I'm just a worthless custodian that takes out the trash, I'm a nobody, I'm worthless, no one cares what I do, right? So it's very, very important that the manager makes sure that, that employee understands how they fit into the big picture. You like you have a question? Oh no, I was just I just had a thought. I know it helps with like uh, what is it, the health inspections and stuff. Mm -hmm. It helps with health inspections. <laughs> we could be saving the organization money if we figured out ways to be more clean and um, improve the patient's health and get them out of the hospital quicker. If we are running a hospital that has historically been very dirty and filthy, it's probably contributed to higher infection rates with our patients, higher sickness. So if we can improve our cleanliness, whether that be by taking out trash or just being more clean in general, we can get our patients out of the hospital quicker, which is going to save us money. Mm -hmm. So all of these little things fit into the big picture and help the organization run more effectively so that we can be successful. Um, so you're right. All right, so we have our informal organization, and we also have a formal organization. The formal organization is what you see on an organizational chart. So you have your president, your vice president, your manager. That's our formal organization. Our informal organization might be what? What do you think is an example of an informal organization? It could be any group within the organization. Like a sub-team or something? Sub-team could be a group of employees that have all worked at the organization for 15 years. Mm -hmm. So they have good knowledge of the organization. They're not, they don't have any formal titles, but people probably still respect them, look up to them with some type of authority. Those are types of, and a sub-team as well, are both types of informal organizations. <coughs> Well, what happens in the informal organizations, we often have the grapevine, who we all know is basically gossip, right? <laughs> informal communication is what happens at lunch, in the lunchroom, in, at the water cooler, in the coffee break room, right? Mm -hmm. That's the grapevine. Mm -hmm. um, we, are, we just talked about our informal leaders, so those are basically people that uh, employees look up to that may not have a formal title. Um, coordinating. Coordinating is important because it allows things to run more smoothly. So a manager that uh, creates a lunch schedule, a lunch break schedule for their employees that doesn't run smoothly, what could happen? Everybody go to lunch at the same time. Everybody go to lunch at the same time, but what happens when that happens? Nobody's there to do the job. Nobody's there to do the work, right? Mm -hmm. Poor coordinating. So um, 
scheduling and coordinating is very important for managers because you do have to make sure that those breaks happen, um, you know, not all at the same time. And even if they happen back to back, that's going to be better than everybody going to lunch at 1230. Because if disaster happens, nobody's going to be there to help. Or even if disaster doesn't happen, even if it's just a normal business, normal day of business, and no one's there to help, things are going to fall apart. Um, controlling. Controlling sounds a little harsh, and it is a little harsh to a certain degree. Um, but it consists of um, correcting, following up. So controlling could be um, her submitting an assignment to me, I'm her manager. Controlling could be me looking over it, giving it back to her to do correctly. It's a form of controlling. Another form of controlling could be me following up. I haven't gotten that report yet. When are you going to get it to me? It's due by 5 p.m. today. Another form of controlling. I have a question. Yes, ma'am. Will micromanagement be uh, considered as a control? Possibly. Process? It's a form of controlling. Uh, it's a form of controlling that a lot of managers like to use. It's not an effective, in my opinion, it's not an effective <coughs> form of controlling. But yeah, definitely, <coughs> micromanaging is a way that people Managers try to control their employees. Um, good question. Sound like you've had experience with micromanagement. <laughs> I think we all probably have at some, some point. point yeah. um, follow up is key. Follow up doesn't always happen. Why do you think it might not happen? Why doesn't follow up happen? They forget. They forget. Not organized. Not organized. Don't care. Don't care. Lazy. Nonchalant. Nonchalant. But it's important. <clears throat> it's very important. Why is it important? Because it will reflect on how the person's doing it, but there's some areas that needs to be improved on. Okay. So it will reflect on the person. <clears throat> it can reflect on both of us. And the business. And the business. If no follow up is <coughs> done, something's going to fall through the cracks. Somebody's going to drop the ball. Your boss is going to want it. Yes. And then I'm going to get in trouble because my big boss wants. And then we're going to get in yeah. trouble. Yeah. And everybody's in trouble. <laughs> everybody's in trouble. So it'll it follow up. It's a domino effect. It's a domino effect. De definitely. I think sometimes <laughs> the people you manage don't realize how much trouble you get in when they don't do their job. Mm -hmm. And you get in more trouble than they do when their job doesn't get done. Mm -hmm. Because the big boss exactly. gets very upset because you're dabbling in their pockets. Mm -hmm. So follow up is very important. Never forget, follow up is key. Very, very important. Um, we're gonna stop there for today. <coughs> Anybody have any questions or comments about chapter three?